Welcome to Partnerism 101, an introduction to a grounded new way of understanding how we can create a more just, peaceful, and sustainable economy, society, and planet. My name is Sarah Salti, and I've had the privilege of working with Rian Eisler and her team for over 10 years, and I'm delighted that you're tuning in to learn more about partnerism. Welcome. In this presentation, we're going to cover two clusters of questions. And the first is a cluster of questions about the domination partnership social scale. We'll talk about the origins of the scale, how domination systems and partnership systems differ, and what we mean by the phrase hierarchies of actualization. Then in the second cluster of questions, we'll look more specifically at the economics of partnerism including the principles of partnerism and how we move in that direction. We'll take a look at how we got stuck with domination economics in the first place, why partnerism is essential now, and why we're focusing so much on metrics in this movement. Um, and I'll introduce you to what is a social wealth index. So let's begin. Where does the concept of partnership systems come from? Rian Eisler has devoted her life to telling a new story about human nature and human possibilities. Her incredible body of work examines many different facets of our human experience, from intimate relationships to education, healthcare, economics, and even our neurobiology. But the through line of all her work is a devotion to illuminating the power of what she calls partnership systems, to support the expression of the best of human nature. Rian's passion for this work is rooted in her early life experiences as a child in Austria during the Nazi occupation of that country, and then as a refugee living in the industrial slums of Havana, Cuba. Those early experiences drove her to ask big, deep questions that many of us have also asked, why? when we humans have such a great capacity for caring, consciousness, and creativity, has there been so much cruelty, insensitivity, and destructiveness? Has it ever been different? Could it be different again? Her search for answers took her deeply into human history, and her book, The Chalice and the Blade, now in 57 US printings and 26 foreign editions, is based on a rereading of 30,000 years of human culture. The short answer is that she found that yes, there have absolutely been times and places in human history from prehistory up to modern times where a very different way of life has been possible, where the ability to give and nurture and sustain life was celebrated and even revered as divine where women and men shared power, and where a spirit of play and care and harmony prevailed. This is great news because it means that conquest, violence, and abuse are not inevitable, not, quote, just human nature. Eisler's multidisciplinary research drew on systems theory, the study of complex living systems and nonlinear dynamics, and ultimately revealed two underlying social configurations, a spectrum of possibilities for human societies, the partnership system and the domination system. We can think of these as two very different operating systems that shape everything about how power and relationships are expressed in a society. No society is a pure partnership system or pure domination system, but the lens of the partnership domination scale reveals patterns that are otherwise not visible. So let's look next at the hallmarks of domination and partnership systems. Domination systems across time and geography share a common configuration. In family, economic, and social structure, we see an authoritarian structure of ranking and hierarchies of domination in family, in, e in the economy, and in society as a whole. So children grow up in authoritarian, punitive, 
male-dominated families where they observe and experience inequity as the norm. The second dimension is fear, abuse, and violence. In domination systems, we see a high degree of fear and violence, from child and wife beating to abuse by superiors in families, workplaces, and society. Domination systems are marked in their gender roles and relations by the ranking of male over female. Rigid, we see rigid gender stereotypes with quote, masculine traits and activities such as toughness and conquest ranked over, quote, feminine ones such as caregiving and nonviolence. And the fourth dimension we look at is narratives and language. And in domination systems, we find beliefs and stories that justify, idealize, and normalize domination and violence. By contrast, partnership societies are organized quite differently. In family economic and social structure, we see a more democratic structure and hierarchies of actualization, a term we'll talk more about in just a moment. Caring is economically valued and egalitarian and equitable adult relations are the norm. In partnership systems, parenting is not authoritarian, but authoritative. Because in partnership systems, we don't see those hierarchies of domination and the, the uh, rankings that they support, we see a low degree of fear, abuse, and violence. They're just not needed in the absence of those top-down rankings. We see a, a high degree of respect for diversity and human rights. In the area of gender roles and relations, we see equal valuing of all genders. We see fluid gender roles with a high value placed on the human values of empathy, caring, caregiving, and nonviolence, regardless of who is expressing them. We also see those values expressed through social and economic policy. And as you might imagine, the narratives and language in partnership systems are also quite different. Here we find beliefs and stories that present empathic, mutually beneficial, nonviolent relations as normal, as moral, and as desirable. So the question often comes up, are there hierarchies in partnership systems? This is a great question, um, and the answer is yes. We, do, we need parents, managers, teachers, leaders. Partnership systems are, there, are not flat, um, but the purpose of hierarchies in, do, in partnership systems are very different. As you heard in our discussion of the two configurations, the core domination system pattern is the pattern of ranking. So hierarchies of domination exist to maintain the rigid rankings of superiors over inferiors. By contrast, the core pattern in partnership systems is the pattern of linking, and hierarchies of actualization exist to support our ability to empower and uplift each other. So in hierarchies of domination, we see an obsession with the question, who's on top? In, there are only two choices in the domination world, dominate or be dominated. We find supremacies, white supremacy, male supremacy, religious supremacy, and either or binaries like male, female, or straight, gay, or black, white. This is a world of in-groups and out-groups, of winners and losers, in which diversity is suppressed and accountability and benefits flow in one direction. But in partnership systems, the, we ask a very different question. What is the quality of our connections? And when we begin with that question, <laughs> everything else flows from that. So mutual respect is highly valued. There is space for non-binary and intersectional identities. Empathy and caring are valued in all genders. Uh, allyship is normalized. Diversity is the condition for creativity and growth, and accountability and benefits flow in all directions. 
What these new categories help us see is that we've been stuck in the wrong story and having the wrong arguments. The struggle for our future is not, as we're told, between old categories that keep us in the box. Categories like right versus left, capitalist versus socialist, Eastern versus Western, religious versus secular. The real struggle for our future is within all of these cultures between domination and partnership. Indeed, we can look at the history of progressive social movements from women's suffrage to civil rights, gay rights, indigenous rights, the peace movement, disability rights, the Me Too movement, and the Black Lives Matter movement, all struggling to shift away from traditions of domination and toward a partnership system. But what does all this have to do with economics? Well, that's what we'll talk about next. So what is partnerism economics and what are its core principles? Partnerism was originally coined by Rian Eisler as a term for the economics that supports partnership systems. She used the term first in her book, The Real Wealth of Nations, to parallel other isms of economic systems like capitalism and socialism. It was at that time synonymous with a caring economics. The term partnerism has now been expanded by Rian Eisler to be used as a synonym for partnership systems that support beliefs, relationships, and institutions that value and reward caring for one another, nature, and our collective future. So there are really three simple core principles of partnerism economics. First, to revalue the work of care. Second, to invest in human capacity development, which really means care for people across the lifespan, and invest in care for the earth. And third, make the vast economic, social, and environmental benefits of these investments visible. How? First, by measuring the value of care. Second, by making visible the connection between the devaluation of care and cycles of poverty. Third, by developing cohesive policies to support partnership families. And fourth, by making the business case for the value of care, showing in dollars and cents the real economic value of care. Before we go forward with our story about caring economics, let's take a quick look back and see how we got stuck with domination economics in the first place. If there's a big story to tell here, more than we can cover today, but let's just start with this. The two economic systems that most of us are most familiar with are capitalism and socialism which we've been taught to see as being locked in an endless battle of the ages. But the truth is that both of these earlier paradigms came out of early industrial times, and both are expressions of domination economics. Neither capitalism nor socialism contain anything about caring for people or nature, and so neither have prevented the destruction of our natural environment. And as for the life-sustaining work that happens in households, caring for children, for sick people, keeping a clean and healthy home environment, that too was not part of the economic equation for Smith or Marx. For them, these vital activities were, quote, just women's work to be performed for free in male-controlled households. It's important that we remember that as late as the mid-19th century, women's work in both homes and the market was legally the property of their fathers or husbands, so much so that if a woman was negligently injured, she couldn't sue for those injuries. Only her husband could for loss of her services. So the economic systems devised by both Smith and Marx are founded on a sort of sneaky trick that reflects the male supremacy worldview of their time. In their time, 
social spheres were sar sharply divided into the, quote, public sphere of law, politics, economics, business, war making. And this domain of men was the place where, quote, productive labor happens. And so the three economic sectors associated with that labor, the market sector, government sector, and even the illegal economy were visible, measured, and valued. But surprise, hidden down there at the bottom of the domination pyramid has all along been a set of three additional economic sectors. We simply couldn't see them because they were associated with the old devalued, quote, inferior private sphere of women. The domination, excuse me, the domain of child rearing, caregiving, community weaving, and caring for nature. By separating these sectors out of their analyses and categorizing them as external to the world of economics, Smith and Marx and legions of economists who followed them have rendered these essential life-sustaining economic sectors invisible, unmeasured, and unvalued. By contrast, partnerism economics includes all six economic sectors to create a complete picture of our economy. What we see in, the, in partnerism economics is that the previously invisible sectors are now made visible and measurable. You might notice that the sectors are not gender coded anymore. We don't have blue economy and pink economic sectors. We have human beings doing human work. Not only that, but in partnerism, these newly visible sectors are understood as key to the success and sustainability of all the other economic sectors, central to the quality of life, essential for a healthy democracy, and key to the sustainability of planet Earth. So why is partnerism essential right now? Let's look at just a top five reasons why partnerism is so essential now. First, we can't build a 21st century world on an 18th century operating system. It simply isn't going to be work, isn't going to work. And part of the reason that they don't work for us now is that domination systems are what Rian Eisler calls trauma factories, not only for human beings, but also deadly for the natural world. In very real terms, the survival of life on this planet is at stake. Third, economic success today requires high quality human capital, a term economists use to describe human beings who are capable of empathy, creativity, and collaboration across diversity. As it turns out, functioning democracies require citizens with these same capacities. And we have an opportunity now to both respond to the impending massive shortage of paid caregivers and end the intractable cycles of poverty caused by the chronic devaluation of care and caregiving work. Now, we don't have time in this presentation to go into any depth on, on all five of these points. We'll save that perhaps for a partnerism 102. But I want to spend a few minutes on number three, this notion that human capacity development is critical to our success in purely economic terms. In the industrial era, we relied on workers with qualities like obedience, comfort with hierarchies of domination, ability to do re repetitive work and to conform. But now in our knowledge service economy, we need different types of workers, different types of citizens, and we place higher value on human capacities like creativity, teamwork, empathy, and the ability to work successfully with diverse colleagues and clients. But people with these capacities don't just happen. They result from experiences starting in early childhood in partnership systems, uh, excuse me, partnership families, schools, and communities. In particular, whether we have these capacities or not depends on our very earliest human experiences. 
In this economic era, more than ever, high quality early care and education is a key driver of economic success because our earliest experiences are critical determinants of whether we grow up with the intellectual, emotional, and cultural capacities to thrive. These links between the quality of early childhood and economic success are made newly visible by recent neuroscience findings. We know now that more than one million new neural connections are formed every second in the first three years of life, that 85% of human brain architecture is formed in the first five years of life, and that a child's relationship with their primary caregivers is a decisive factor in the quality of that architecture. And we also know that brain architectures are strikingly different in people raised in domination or partnership cultures. In our earliest years, we learn either to respect the rights of others and gain the skills to successfully link with them, or we learn to normalize violence, cruelty, entitlement, and prejudice. Whether children are raised in domination or partnership settings, impacts our feelings and beliefs about the meaning of difference, about violence, about who and what is or is not valuable, and our capacity to grasp complexity and to function in a complex world. Now, domination system proponents have campaigned intensively for a return to family structures that conform to domination system rankings, and they have had some success. Regressives have spent decades rebuilding the foundations for domination systems, especially focusing on family and gender relations. As a result, when Americans were polled in 1992 on whether they agreed with the statement, the father is the master of the house, 42% said yes. By 2004, that number rose to 52%. These changed poll numbers were the result of a deliberate political campaign to reinstate domination-oriented attitudes under the guise of, quote, family values and morality. Pushing attitudes back to the normative ideal of the male-dominated authoritarian family helped set the stage for the move toward authoritarianism and in-group versus out-group thinking that so many of us have witnessed with such dismay in the years since 2016. Progressives can no longer afford to dismiss parent-child relations and gender relations as just women's issues. Partnerism helps us see that these are critical levers for economic success and social change. If we want to create partnership societies oriented to equity, sustainability, and justice, we must invest in partnership families that model mutually respectful, empathic, egalitarian relations. If we want a thriving and sustainable 21st century economy and a thriving and sustainable democracy, we must invest in accessible, high quality early childhood education delivered by well-trained and well-paid educators. We need, uh, and we know that partnership families and schools don't exist in a vacuum. They must be supported by partnership communities that we can invest in that cultivate nonviolence, racial and gender equity, social cohesion, health, arts, and civic culture. And all of this brings us to our final question for today. Why does partnerism focus on metrics? And what is a social wealth index? It's quite simple, really. We measure what we want to see grow. And if we want to grow our social wealth, we need to measure it. You may know that uh, at the moment, the most widely recognized measure of economic health is GDP, or gross domestic product, which was devised in 1934 as a barometer for economic success 
in an old economy driven by industry and manufacturing. And it's worth noting that even at that time, the originators of the GDP warned against using it as an international standard of economic success. There are lots of issues with GDP, but big one includes that, it in, that the GDP includes activities that harm and even take life. So cigarette manufacturing and all the health-related costs, funeral bills, all on the, on the plus side of, uh, in the GDP. So are the costs of oil spills, all the cleanup costs, lawyers' bills, etc., are a bonanza for GDP. On the flip side, GDP leaves out the stuff we all want more of. GDP does not count the life-sustaining activities of the household, natural, and community volunteer sectors of the economy. So a stand of old growth trees only counts if it's cut down and turned into products. And by the way, yes, the economic value of care can be quantified. When it has been measured, household, household work alone adds up to anywhere between 20 and 50% of GDP. And of course, child rearing is only part of that work. In 2017, 41 million family caregivers in the United States provided an estimated 34 billion hours of care to an adult with limitations in daily activities and to elder parents and adults with disabilities. The estimated economic value of their unpaid contributions was approximately $470 billion. None of that is included in the GDP. If the dynamics of social wealth continue to remain invisible and untracked, we'll be unable to see and manage the most powerful drivers of economic prosperity. Which is why, over the past 10 years, the Center for Partnership Studies has pioneered the development of social wealth economic indicators, or SWAYS. These new measures do something that's not part of other proposals for alternative measures. The SWAYS measure both the inputs to social wealth, how much business and social investment in care we see, and the outputs of those investments. How much are humans and our environments actually flourishing? For the United States, the picture that emerges from the Sways data graphically reveals just how stuck we have been in domination economics. Just a little snapshot here. The United States invests less than half as much in family benefits as other OECD nations invests the least in early childhood care and education of all major developed nations, has a child poverty rate twice the OECD average. The United States ranks, uh, has the highest infant mortality rate of all major developed nations. And we know that those more infant mortality rates are far higher in uh, black and brown communities than in white ones. And in the United States, we pay child care workers less than in other developed nations. At a launch event for the Sways, uh, we invited Ai-jen Pu, who many of you may have heard of, who's the director of, of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And she said, we need Sways to be able to talk about the material implications of not accounting for the family care needs of 21st century families. It's Sways that will help us make the arguments and help us raise awareness about this invisible care architecture that actually is holding up our economy and needs to be supported, nurtured, protected, invested in to become more sustainable for all of us. At that same event, uh, Eric Norman brought a business person's perspective. He's the senior vice president for human resources at Cardinal Health, a Fortune 500 company. He said Sways will help businesses understand that for our future human capital, our people, we depend on the national investment in human capacity development, which we're lagging in. So the thing about GDP, despite all its flaws, is that it's easy to use as it consists of one number. And our goal is to develop a social wealth index that condenses and updates the sways, showing the relationship between care investment and human capacity. 
and hence economic health and a thriving population and planet. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. We're so excited to welcome you into the work of forging a partnership future. Finally, with partnerism, we can see the interconnections of all four of these cornerstones. We can stop marginalizing gender relations, childhood relations, and intimate violence as just women's issues, and instead treat the experiences of women, children, and families as the essential foundations of a better world. We can advocate for economic measures, rules, and policies that recognize the dollars and cents value of caring for people and nature, and end cycles of poverty that have trapped caregivers for too long. And critically, we can change the narrative. We can leave behind old stories that tell us that domination is inevitable and normal, and step out of old debates that pit right versus left or capitalism versus socialism. We can shift the conversation to partnerism and create systems that empower the best of our human capacities for caring, consciousness, and creativity. It's a big picture, yes, but we're up to the challenge. None of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. Thank you for tuning in to begin to discover what your something is going to be. To join the partnerism movement, please visit www.partnerism.org. And to learn more about Rian Eisler and partnership systems, please visit www.centerforpartnership.org.